Okay, let's start on uh, chapter two. And just to keep Mark happy, static test analysis. <laughs> <laughs> let's look at some static. What do we mean by static? Not moving or almost not moving? Almost not moving. Very, very low speed. Because there is really no such thing as true static. Some of the things we may look at here, Young's modulus is the classic lab type, finding Young's modulus proper materials or other material properties, things like yield strength and such like. Um, lots of different, depends on the industry you're in, but there's lots and lots of different uh, material properties that we may want to back out from a static load deflection type of testing or fatigue testing. Even fatigue, low, free, low cycle fatigue, we can think of as almost static. Um, after all, we're only cycle. Oh, actually, <laughs> I said that uh, one to two cycles per second is actually fast for some people. So uh, we have to be careful. Between pressure vessels, they need to be proof tested. So there's a lot of stuff there. Have you ever done acoustic emission? Any of you? You know what acoustic emission is? I should not worry. I start at that stage. Basically, if we start to break the material or, or flex the material and starts to, to break. Internally, you get these little type noises like this as the grain boundaries move or it's a composite material, the fibers either break or move against each other. And uh, that depends on a number of things, um, the stress or strain that the structure is under, but also as the structure gets close to failure, then we get more and more of those uh, little breakages. And they're discrete events. And so acoustic emission is a whole art of um, health monitoring where you put an acoustic emission sensor on that listens for those pulses coming through. And then you count them. And the rate that they come through is an indication of how close to failure you are, why the internal damage is going on. And so um, it's very common on pressure vessels. And basically, as you increase the pressure, you'll get an increased count of, these, of this acoustic emission going on. And so they can use that as a guide to uh, the health of the, of the pressure vessel. Um, and then all sorts of other things going on that we, we can think of as static or very close to static. Here's a stress strain curve. Tell me what's wrong with that. Mechanical engineering, 101. What's wrong with what? The graph. Have you ever seen a graph that plots like that, stress against strain? Not one egg. Of course, all the way down. No, and there's usually other things going on over here. Yeah, if it's steel, we get a drop off and come back up again. It usually comes up and then rolls down. And issues like that. Um, but the kind of thing it's we're like looking a break at. Point. What's that? Sorry, probably. It's like it seems like it had a break point. Right here, yes. Yeah, right. Out. Yeah, and it's a sort of artificial the way that's uh, shown on there. Um, but um, basically, we may be looking for things like uh, failure and such like. And um, things like uh, this region here is, is linear, Hope's law, it's close to linear anyway. But then there's a region up to about here where it's still elastic. Elastic meaning if I take the load off, I basically go down the same line and end up with zero deflection. And that's it's into the nonlinear area. Then if I go a little bit further, now I'm starting to get um, some uh, um, um, uh, was it? Oh, I wasn't thinking of hysteresis, the um, uh, plastic deformation, some plastic deformation, bending or stretching or depends on the mode we're operating in. And then when I come back down again, I'll come down another line and that line will actually be, for most um, metals anyway, will actually be uh, a straight line and it has a permanent offset on it, and that slope should be the same or close to the same as the other one. So there's all sorts of things we may want to look at on, on those. So when we acquire data for a stress strain test, typically we acquire load against time and strain against time. We don't actually acquire load against strain. So my question for you is, how many of you have done stress strain testing or load deflection testing? When have you done that? Okay. What type of control did I have on my system for this set of data? 
There's a strain control, load control. Could you do those? Strain control or load control? Yeah, displacement control or... or I don't know what you mean by control. Okay, when you're doing a stress drain test, you say to the, you know, got maybe a crosshead machine that's, that's going to hold, which is in a simple type of thing. I mean, it doesn't have to be that, but the, the, the uh, um, wishbone type. Oh, I see. No, so we control the load. Yeah, so you control the load. What was controlled here? One test. This is what data from one test. This is displacement control. Because as time went on, the load went up and then it dropped up again as we get into necking and such like. Whereas if you're doing load control, it would just keep going up. Strain, the strain just keeps going up as a function of time. And therefore, this must have been under displacement control. Basically, it means you're just raising the head at constant rate and measuring the resulting load. There's two different ways of doing the tests. See, um, I'm confused. Okay, when we do, when we say, when we say go, the cross head has to be raised at a certain rate. Yeah. So, so you're you're right. Actually, what we do with them is the displacement. Yeah, it's the most common. Yeah. We just and then we just correlate the load to the strain. Yes. Yes. So basically in this particular test here, we started to increase the move the cross head up and move the cross head up at a constant speed. As we move the cross head up at a constant speed, we get a constant increase in strain, change in length over original length. And we monitor the load and the load increased and then at some stage it dropped up again. If we had done load control, that is where we monitor the load and adjust the speed that we raise the head to maintain the load constant. Then we would have had the load going up and the strain would have had to change the speed that we raise the head. See, the interesting thing is that that's not from an actual test, is it? I doubt it. Right, because you have the contact loads. Yes. And the strain actually doesn't maintain the same slope. It goes up and then it changes slope to the slope. Right, it, it, it can do it. And as the grips change, you get in a bite and all those yeah. kind of things. And if the strain is not yeah. placed properly, then you start seeing the strain people. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Just run into the last bit. Yeah. Yeah, an actual test has a lot more subtlety going on. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, essentially what we're just basically doing is saying, hey, we've measured as a function of time in reality. And then we correlate them together by plotting load against strain like that. Um, in this particular one, I think what he's done is he's just taken a straight line and an arbitrary curve and added some noise, I suspect. So, the modulus is the slope of the linear region. So, somewhere down here is a linear region. The slope of that is the Young's modulus. Now, there's something I disagree with on this slide. I disagree with them vehemently, but that's because of my background. And again, it's one of these things that I do something one way, somebody else does something the other way. We can argue all day long about which is the best way, but we'll probably get the same result at the end. You don't like eyeballing. I do not like eyeballing a straight line through the data. Nobody with this nice. I hate that with a passion. But let me explain where I'm coming from. There are some tests where I actually will eyeball. If I'm doing a ring down test and I'm looking for trying to find the damping structure, I found that if I go to the, the, the graph and just go, oh, that looks like an exponential, that looks like an exponential, and use that and calculate that, I get as good if not better results than if I do a fancy analysis. But in this case, because I'm looking for a straight line, my background, as Simon very well remembers, is uncertainty analysis. You don't remember? Oh gosh, this is getting worse. I think that I think it, that's it's picking again. That's yes. moving my mind somewhere else. I was running. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna tell Mark he has to sign you up for another uncertainty course. <laughs> but a part of the statistics and uncertainty, yeah, because you didn't learn it right the first time, so we're gonna penalize you same time, is that I like to look at a regression analysis. I look at um, 
and I can look at that. I can bring in uncertainty into the regression, and I can pull up all sorts of numbers like 95% confidence intervals and, and all those other things that I can do that I cannot do by eyeballing. So, yes, at the end of the day, we get basically the same results. But I want to be able to come back and say, this is my, this is my, my young modulus, and here is the uncertainty. And if I do the regression properly, I can also pick up where the data start to go nonlinear much easier than doing eyeball. So I disagree vehemently with that. But as I said, um, you can come from the other side and you can get pretty good results as well. I'm not going to say very good results because I like my way. But, uh, you still need to look at the data with the regression and the data and the uncertainty analysis. So, so what are some of the problems we saw with that data? It's noisy. What are we going to do about that noise? Should we filter? We could time domain filter. Yeah. Look at some of that. We can do some analytic curve fitting, eyeball smoothing as we go through. So basically, um, we need to look at uh, different things that are going to affect us. We need to know something about the science. He puts the word phenomenon here. I like to use the word science. We need to know something about the science behind what the, what's, what's going on. If you give me a set of data, and don't tell me what it's from, I can do lots and lots of different curve fits, but they may have absolutely no meaning at all. I need to know the fundamental science. Yes. <laughs> the example I like to give on that is uh, a few years ago, I was on a panel where we were assessing um, undergraduate research. It was called a Trident Project. And that they, they spent virtually their entire senior year doing nothing but this, this project. They're the ones who've got well ahead in their coursework. Rather than let them graduate early, some of, some of them, a select few, 20 out of 1,000 maximum, that kind of number is 10 or a dozen, so 20, can do these, these research projects. And there's one person who got this set of data, which kind of looked a bit like this, except there was a little one dot was down. And it was pressures taken off a hole as it dragged down a, a tow tank. And they put a curve fit on, it went up, down, up, and then it's had a little wiggle on the end. And they spent a whole chapter explaining why the standard theory says it should look this way, but why this phenomena dipped down and went up again and was rising at the end, and how it was a little different and they found something new. And it was a huge thing. And so then it came to me, and a whole chapter on this, came to me as a reviewer, and there's a panel of us, like about uh, six or eight of us, reviewing it. And I looked at it and went, if I cover that one point, all of a sudden their data fits exactly the theory they were testing. And I asked them, said, what if? What if there's a noise on that? What if that one point's got an error? You know, you've got a blockage in your Peter tooth or something like that. And they kind of went, oh. But Excel gave me. And that you Wait, they really didn't think of the social yeah. process for that. Yeah, they got. They got marked down quite a bit for that. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, that's a liar here. You exactly. need to look at it. I agree. But this is this had actually got through the... In the, the uh, they were actually generating new scientific explanations as to what was going on based on one single point yeah. with error on it. And so that's the kind of thing we have to watch. If they didn't know the site, well, what they should have done is said, Oh, this is the science. That doesn't look right. Let's, let's go back and reassess. Um, but if I just said, here's some data, I would have probably given them the same curve and said, there it is. So that's why I say we have to know the science that's going on behind. Um, you cannot do a decent curve fit without knowing that. So why do we curve fit? I curve fit because that's how I do calibration. I use the equation from the curve fit to convert. Okay, so in your case, you're saying you do a calibration. I'm going to rephrase what you just said. You do a calibration. It has noise and scatter associated with it. You do some sort of curve fit, whether it's straight line, polynomial, I don't know. It doesn't matter. You do a curve fit. That allows you to find an estimate of the underlying behavior. It's not the underlying behavior, it's our best estimate. And then you use that to predict future performance. 
into, yeah, well, I use it, actually, I use it to convert from volts to a unit in later experiments. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to turn my noise up. Excuse me while I turn my noise up. Um, and so being able to take something and then predict future performance. For example, if we have statistical data and we find means and standard deviations, very often we're going to say, let's take a set of data, let's curve it. When we find a mean and a standard deviation, we are basically curve it. And then we're going to use that information to predict future performance. Like if I'm looking at light bulb failures, and I've got a some sort of distribution. It won't be a normal distribution. But I've got some sort of distribution that I've got off my experiments. I can then go and predict uh, how many light bulbs are going to fail in the next 500 hours. Okay. So for predictive purposes, we're going to smooth the data. We're going to get that roughness and bumpiness. We can also then use that to interpolate between points. Think of low-grade uh, calibration of a thermometer. Put it in melting ice and go, that's zero degrees centigrade. Put it in steam, go, that's 100 degrees centigrade. And then we'll draw a straight line between the two. And I'm thinking now of something like a alcohol in glass thermometer or something like that, rather than a thermocouple. But essentially we say, that's zero, that's 100, draw a straight line between. And so if you get an alcohol in thermometer glass, uh, the alcohol in glass thermometer, you can check zero, you can check 100, and then all the graduations are equal to the space between. And what I've done is a linear interpolation between that, um, as I said, it's a low grade calibration. So you get the idea. Same idea here. Miguel does all his calibration. But when you then go and take a real value, it doesn't match one of the exact numbers that you did in your calibration, so we're going to use that curve, the slope, hopefully a zero intercept, to, to then predict or to interpolate between the values. So it's a predictive type interpolation. What about extrapolation? Well, actually, can I go back to something you oh, said? Oh, sure, yeah. So you said it's hopefully a zero intercept, but in cases it's not because of five grades in the, in the acquisition with the A to D conversion. Right, right. So. Do you, what I typically do is offset that bias. Yes, I think that's a wise thing to do. Like, uh, if you're if calibrating, you're, say you're calibrating an A to D, and I don't know, put a sine wave in and measure the numbers coming out or something, I don't know what kind of, you do that. Well, I, I have all kinds of, right. but, but you put something in and you measure the output. Right. Um, yeah, if you measured an offset, then yeah, you should return that into account. Remove it so that basically you're shifting yeah. your curve to yes. zero. Yes. Crossing. Yeah, so if 0.32 thousand happens to be match your zero, then that's now the new zero and you're just it's not going to be exact. You know, there'll still be some residual bit that you can't get rid of. But that's the best thing that you can do yeah. to do that. Yeah, because if your calibration is detected an offset, you should subtract. Yeah, so you come up your line and then you do minus. Yes. yes, yes. It's like an error um, in if you're calibrating a mass balance, for example. Right. So you go standard mass and it says on the side this is hundred grams. And you calibrate it with 98, then that'd be huge. But with 98 grams, now there's a two gram error you can take account of between essentially. So what I do also because of the uncertainty in the measurement, is if I see an offset that is significant, so we've been talking about a couple of counts here. Yeah. yeah. I redo the test a couple of times to make sure that you put it over. Yes, absolutely. The offset is removable. Yes. If you do not get repeatability then there's something wrong somewhere. And, and, you're, and you use that inherent, if it's a couple of counts, it's okay, but if it's more, I repeat it. If you get suddenly get a large number, and then you don't, and then you get a negative number, and you don't, there's something wrong somewhere, either in the calibration or in the ATD. I ran into that just recently, trying to verify a channel. I, I was using a pressure sensor, and it was out of tolerance. So I got another couple of pressure sensors, and they were the same out of tolerance. Be, be, uh, therefore, it's a data acquisition system. They did that for system, yeah. Almost so. And then I measured them on a different channel, and they were quite on Okay, so it's a channel. So and it's a content offset, so I can use that channel. And it's just offset. Yeah. yeah, providing it is just a constant offset. Yeah, that's a perfect example of... Uh, okay. What about extrapolation? Yeah. 
interpolation. I set my did my calibration, got a straight line, and I'm now using that there. Extrapolation, I got some of my data, got a straight line, now I want to know what's going on up here. Can we do that? I'm asking you why not. I'm going to say probably not. So extrapolate. That depends. Yeah, go on, Ellie. Yes. <laughs> yes, right. Okay. That depends on the, uh, for example, for the aircraft, sometimes they can extrapolate some few points to just try to determine the to determine the envelope in which the aircraft can fly. But it depends on what you have to do. As most of the time, it's advised not to extrapolate data. I agree 100%. Yeah. Extrapolation is very, very dangerous. Really, in the aircraft example you gave, there's a lot of historical information which says that particular extrapolation is, is OK. But you have a lot of historical data to shoot, show that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in that situation, it's probably OK. Well, it is OK for that. But in general, don't extrapolate. It's a very, very dangerous thing to do. Let's give an example. Simon sits on the table. We measure the deflection. Pablita sits next to him. We measure the deflection. Miguel sits next to him. We measure the deflection. We've now found the deflection per person. We extrapolate and say, when I get on the table with you as well, that means it's going to get out of such a certain, certain amount. What happens when I get on the table? It breaks. Yeah, there's an the example of very bad extrapolation. And that happens all the time. People will extrapolate. Do not extrapolate. Except like in Ellie's example there, if you have very strong evidence that, that what you're measuring is a small part of something which is ongoing, so you need historical information or some good science behind it or something, don't, don't be extrapolated. That, 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 that really push that out. So the actual numbers, mathematics is, uh, is uh, complex and tedious, is an understatement if you have to do it by hand. In the good old days, we used to have to do all our co-fitting by hand. Came up with some wonderful algorithms to minimize the amount of math and reduce the errors because the slide rules and such like were uh, limited in their accuracy. Um, there are uh, some data, uh, obviously now computerized, things can go very well. There's going to be a lot of pitfalls though. A lot of the algorithms don't work right. I haven't shown you the uh, Excel that fails, the linear regression test, have I? I'll have to see if I can get that onto, onto this computer here um, over the next break. But I have an example where Excel um, can't put a straight line through three points. It's wrong. And so be careful. It's a pitfall. We tend to just assume, hey, it's done on the computer. It must be right. So I don't want to do that. I'll show you the example. Um, so I'll try and get that across from my, my, uh, my tablet there and onto this. Um, hey, let's look at linear regression. Why is that the $17 word? Come to clue. The $17 word, linear regression, for finding the best straight line approximations. I'm not quite sure. I don't know what it means. It's either very cheap or very expensive, I'm not quite sure we're saying that. But linear regression, um, basically we're regressing a line to find the what we're going to define as the best fit. There are many definitions of best fit. The one we most commonly use is the least squares error, but you do not have to use that as the best fit if the science behind it says that something better will work. Some of the assumptions that we have are that the x coordinate is exact and all of the error is in the y direction. As a consequence, if I back up, if I plot load against strain and do a linear regression, the assumption is all the strain measurements are exact and all the error is in the load. If I flip the graph over and plot strain against load, the assumption now is that all the load measurements are exact and all the errors in the strain, and I will get a very slightly different line. Okay, there's a reciprocal relationship between slopes, but I will get a slightly different regressed line. 
Both of them are wrong. But both of them are close. So we have to remember that. Um, and um, it, it's typically, if uh, the difference is significant, then it's suggesting you're fitting a wrong model and the straight line isn't working or there's a huge amount of error on one measurement, not very much on the other. So that's where you can go back and maybe have to do a different type of regression. But that is one of the assumptions. If you just press the give me a linear regression, that's true in Excel, it's true in MATLAB, um, MathCAD, all of those, if you start to just say give me a regression, that's the inherent assumption. We look at the error. The error is the difference between the measurement points and our predicted line. It is not the actual best line, it's our best estimate of the line. Somebody else does the test, I've got a different set of answers. There's the straight line we're looking at, and if we sum that lot up, we get these equations. We can show those in many different ways. For example, I like to look at the sum of x to be n times x bar, n times the average. So we get n squared, n squared x bar squared, right now to the sum. That's my old days when you had to adjust, you know, just the calculations to minimize efforts. But essentially, we're now looking at slope and intercept coming in, and they're our best estimates. If you do a full regression, you will also get extra lines that come around that graph here, which will show you, for example, the 95% confidence interval in the slope, 95% confidence interval in the intercept, or the combined 95% confidence on the overall fit. And so if, for example, I'm doing a regression on calibration, like in your case, Miguel, what I would do is I would look separately at the 95% confidence interval on the slope and 95% confidence interval on the intercept. The intercept comes to that DC offset, which I said, remember I said hopefully and we talked about it. And it says, okay, I've come up with a count of two, but my 95 confidence interval says plus or minus four. Okay, zero is an acceptable number, or it tell you it's acceptable there. And then the separately, I look at the 95% confidence on the slope, and that gives me an estimate of how accurate the sensitivity is that's come out of my calibration. Um, one number by itself isn't really much use. We need to get a family of those of, over time. And so then you can look and see if all of a sudden the confidence intervals start to increase, there's something going wrong with the calibration process or the equipment or something. And if the, uh, so you, you know, if I just say to you, oh, it's one plus or minus 0.1 at 95%, that doesn't mean anything. Well, it does, but it's of less use until you've got that historical database um, going on. Um, you could, for example, see if you did all of the different data D boards and looked at a 95% confidence on the uh, on the slopes for each of those. Um, if there's one board which is, I'll say, going bad, lower grade, whatever you want to call it, you might see the confidence as well, and that one be wider than the others. That's the kind of thing. So. Um, that's, uh, that's something I do. With my undergraduates, um, when we get into the measurements course, and I say, we're going to do linear regression, they all smile and say, we've done that before. They know you haven't. And they all pull up Excel, and they all put the regression line, and I show them it doesn't work. And then we do all this, this error analysis, because I think that's important. And then they go away with two minutes. So there's an example. Um, OK, you've got five minutes to check all the numbers in the table. No, you haven't. <laughs> there is something that I dislike about this graph. Well, it's not so much the actual trends or plots or points. There's something fundamentally distasteful to me about a graph like that. And that is that the, this line where I've got the laser pointer right now, this one, that's a straight line. It's continuous. It is the best fit line that's come out of this analysis. But what about this line, and this line, and this line? Hmm. I don't like to see raw data values joined by a line. The one exception to that is spectral data where I'm looking at frequency response functions and the joining the dots to visualize what's going on, to make sure we don't miss a couple of points. That, that's OK because it's helping to visualize what's going on with the data. But in general, here we should be showing discrete points. We should not be joining the lines. I really believe that quite strongly. Can, can you uh, 
maybe I'm remembering it correctly, but I thought that the premise of the least square fit was that about 50% of the points were on one side of the line. You know, the side. <laughs> um, about, about, but um, it's it, it's not exactly, it, because it's a, it depends on the error squared, and so the more of an outlier it is, it will overweight. So you can actually have it with all virtually all the points on one side and one strongly up on the other side. Which is what's happening here, right? The, line, yeah. and the one side you've got some very or close. they're closer to the line. Right, right. Okay. So um, if there's equal error in all the points, that will be about right. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be because of the outlier. And it's a squared, so so um, it isn't like it's just you know, if you've got an error of one compared to an error of two, you can bring one to four in the waste average. One of the things that's nice to know though is that if I found the average x of my measured data and I find the average y of my measured data, slope goes through that point. It's kind of nice, isn't it? Doesn't matter what the scatter of points. If I got masses of points down here and one up there, and I find the average x and the average y, the graph always goes through the average point. Now, we also have a thing called a correlation coefficient, or R. Um, R is, again, something which by itself has minimal use, but over history will help us. And it's a way of correlating uh, this line, essentially. And what it says is that the closer this is to a straight line, that the measured data is to a straight line, the higher the correlation coefficient. The limit is, this is the math or one of the ways of showing the equation. And um, the upper limit for any set of data is plus one. The lower limit is minus one. Actually shows zero, but it's actually minus one. So plus one tells me that there's an absolute perfect correlation between the data. And if you're doing a regression and you report, do you report correlation coefficients on your data? One of the things I push like crazy is that if you've got a correlation coefficient of 0.999, for example, don't show it as 1, show it as 0.999. If you've got a correlation coefficient of 0.99999, don't show it as 1, show it as 0.99999. The reason I want to see that is because if you say 1, you have told me perfect correlation, no noise whatsoever, and I don't like to see that with any measured data. So even if you have put lots and lots of numbers out before it goes to 0.99995, okay, it's one, but at least it's shown that the calculation has been done right. That's my personal view. So it doesn't say anything about the slope. All it talks about is how well the data fits to a straight line. And it's of a positive correlation coefficient, then it means slope is positive. If it's a negative coefficient, it means the slope is negative, but it doesn't say anything about the magnitude. And zero means totally uncorrelated. But we never get zero. We never get one, unless somebody's fiddled the data. Actually, there's a couple of examples where I did, you can get one. One of the examples is the students, for me, do a very simple load deflection test for, um, they, make, they install a strain gauge and do a load deflection test. And in that condition, they're putting about five or six discrete levels of you know, one pound, two pounds, three pounds. And you can actually get it where the, because of the rounding in the uh, machine, and its discrete values come out of that, you can actually end up with discrete values where they get a one, but that's an exception. Um, but what we can do is we can look up in the books, what is an acceptable correlation coefficient for data? Um, typically with engineering, if it looks like the data is correlated, that's a better estimate. But there are tables that say, for purely random data, this is the level of correlation that I'd expect. I could get just with purely random data. And so we're looking for our correlation coefficient to be higher than that. If in engineering you get down in that noisy level, you've got a big issue. If somebody says, hey, you've done all this stuff, now I've got some medical data I want you to analyze. The, we gave people a pill to see if their headache went away. Huge scatter on the data there then you'll be looking at correlation coefficients of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and then you've got to be looking back in the tables to say, is this statistically significant or not? 
So there is a difference between how we use the correlation. Um, there are several different correlations that we can come across in several different curve pits. There's an example of R is 1. That's incorrect. What should that be? No, this is theoretical data, so it could be perfectly correlated. It should be minus 1, because it's a negative slope. So it, here is a nice elliptical type stuff with coefficients. And there is some interesting things, though. The correlation coefficient does assume we're looking at a straight line curve fit. And so if you've got a strong function, a sine wave function, some, uh, some polyno higher order polynomials, that sort of thing, the correlation coefficient can come out incredibly low. In fact, a circle like this, the correlation coefficient is zero. But clearly, the x and y data are, using the English version, correlated. So don't blindly use correlation coefficient to look at the data model. So there's some examples of uh, fitting the to fitting to the noisy data. Coefficient of 0.989. Pretty good. We typically see up there for engineering. Is there an advantage to eyeballing? Look at that more accurate. I strongly disagree with that. Okay, this is kind of backwards here. Is eyeballing give us more accurate and more significant figures? No, it's the regression that gives us more accurate and more significant figures. But I do agree with the engineering judgment. You do have to go back and look at the graph and make sure it's plotting. And particularly, for example, with something like this, we may want to look at the residuals, the leftover little pieces, and plot those. And then we can use those to start to pick up where the function is breaking away from linear to nonlinear, for example, in that case. Um, We can also do polynomial regression. And it's the same basic concept that we assume all the x values are exact. And now, instead of just having uh, some coefficient, the slope times x, we're bringing the higher order ones, the slope times something times x squared and such like. The basic concept is exactly the same. Um, before, I didn't show you the detailed math, but if we start off with the straight line, uh, y is ax plus b type of calculation. Um, at that stage, when we do the uh, calculate the um, least squares co-fit, we have to differentiate two times, one with respect to the slope and one with respect to the intercept. Set those to zero to generate the, the lowest value. Remember in calculus, if you differentiate the set to zero, it gives you a minimum. So we do that in the middle. Here, we'll generate a, a bigger equation, if it's a squared, for example, and then we'll do three differentiations with respect to a0, a1, and a2. Set each of those equivalent to zero. And uh, at that stage, we've now got three sometimes equations to solve. In this case, we've got an nth order. So we've got n plus 1 differentiations to do n plus 1 orders. And what we find is that if you do that, the actual matrix you have to develop um, starts to build up a pattern. And so if you have to go back to square 1, math 101 to, to do this, do the first two or three, and you go, oh, there's the pattern in the matrix. And then you can develop all of a sudden to whatever order that you want. But the concept is that we're fitting a higher and higher order polynomial. What do we know about the shape of graphs that have higher and higher orders in the polynomial here? What does that do for us? Going from the linear to the squared, we can get some curvature to the shape, to the line. And as we go higher and higher, we can get more and more undulations and more curvature based on those higher terms. So we have to be careful not to use too high a slope thing as we go through. So there's the uh, regression. We have to, um, we can't go to an infinite number. If I've got 10 data points, I can't put the 12th order polynomial on. It will not work. So here's some examples, some data, same set of data in each graph. There's the best fit straight line, bottom left. Second order, quadratic. Top right, third order, cubic. Bottom right, fourth order, quartic. Which one's best? 
Okay, I want you to look at those four graphs, and I want you to write down the things that you think are leading towards it being the best fit. Then I'm going to ask you to tell me why you think it's the best fit. Okay, Simon, you're first. Which do you think is the best fit? Fortunately, there's four graphs and four of it, so you can all pick, pick a different one if you like. Which one do you think is the best fit? The second order. The second order? Yeah. Okay. Kavlita? Fourth order. Fourth order. Miguel? It depends. <laughs> Safe answer. Hey, I, you, you can't pick his answer. Safe answer. <laughs> now, 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 what's your answer? So, so I we haven't asked Ellie yet. I would say I would say the fourth order. Okay, Ellie. I need to know more. Ellie. Yeah, I agree with you. Which do you think that? Uh, um, I would. If I, because the fourth order, what bothered me is the beginning of a signal. You know the first point. The, the first point. Yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah. This bother me. But if we just cut that and start at the first point, I would say the first order is the best fit because the the error error is less if you use each point from the line from the curve. Okay, I'm going to disagree with all of you. And I'm not going to say it depends. I'm going to say, I can't say. Because I don't know the underlying science behind what that data is trying to generate. Boy, that's what I said. I know. You, <laughs> kind of had, you didn't put it quite like that. No, no I said I need more information. Need more information. <laughs> and the missing information is we don't know the underlying science. We need to know. If this was meant to be looking for Young's modulus in the elastic region, then I would say this is the best fit. Because I don't want to see Young's modulus doing this. Yeah? yeah? So you all fell into the trap. I agree with the bits you said. And Ellie, I really like the fact you're looking down here because you're into extrapolation. And this is a good example of how extrapolation is potentially very, very dangerous. So, and I have actually a, a real world example for that. Actually, the fifth order is that when you buy string gauges, even if they are STC matched, meaning that they are coded to match the material which you have to like the the manufacturer, yes. or the others, they give you a fifth order polynomial for the temperature compensation. Yes. And it's a fifth order polynomial, but they specifically tell you, you know, look at the range of temperature and make sure that you are... Because you cannot extrapolate behavior. outside right. because of issues just like... Yeah, so the fit is a good fit in the middle where you are in the middle yes. of your ranges. But yes. on the outside, you're, you're on your own. Bad, like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's a great example. Yes. Yeah. All right. So good discussion there. One thing to recognize is that you can order fit a polynomial up to eventually one less number of data points. Essentially, if I have five points, I can fit a fourth order. Four points, I can fit a cubic exactly. The, re the argument being that if I have a quadratic, for example, the x squared term, the linear term, and the offset, three numbers. So there I've got three pieces of information, three simultaneous equations, and therefore I can calculate three coefficients for three data points. So I can go just quadratic. If we do that, the curve will fit exactly through the data points. But the danger is that between the points, we can calculate the numbers, but it may be other garbage. So there are other issues, and we'll talk about spline fitting and sampling a little bit as we go here. There's some uh, examples um, that they're showing. It's the same kind of discussion about whether we can extrapolate or not. Um, but particularly notice this comment at the bottom. I agree 100% with. If we have noise, then the higher order polynomials are desperately trying to fit that noise in the signals. Uh, is kind of a non-mathematical way of saying it. But um, essentially, noise can very, very quickly mess things up. Now, I mentioned the co the um, that uh, we have standard um, polynomials for uh, for thermocouples. Here's one example. I think NIST is the ultimate for all of the polynomials. Um, and this is a J-type. 
And what I want you to recognize here is that here is the, the coefficients for the polynomial. And they basically say, what is the voltage that I measure from the thermocouple? How do I get it back to temperature? These are the coefficients into that polynomial. But notice that even this, it can't do us for a wide temperature range. It fits in very close to the Vichy stuff you were just talking about, Miguel. If you're operating a J-type in this frequency range, here are the coefficients. Feed them in to the polynomial, and then take a voltage and get it to be temperature. And being very careful that we have to change those coefficients. Notice we're going from a, an eighth-order polynomial at low temperature to a seventh to a fifth at high temperatures as it backs off. Uh, that's interesting that initially we put out a table because you use this table, you're assuming that there's no difference in the actual material properties between the initials and what you manufacture. Well, so as soon as you see J-type. So I know it's the same that, type of material, but it doesn't mean it's uniform. It should be, though. If you have a pure NIST thermocouple J-type, then that should, that should be as well. Like you, you mean that it's been traceable to NIST standards? Yes. Yeah. Uh, for example, the K-type is uh, alumel and was it chromal? chromal? That's right, yeah. yeah. And so those are well-defined materials. If you have materials that are made to those standards, you make a K-type thermocouple and this gives you the polynomial with it. And you've got to come back and say, yes, but what if I test it in the lab? Good luck to you. But in reality, if you go into your data acquisition system and say, I have a J-type thermocouple, it's just you've just programmed in all these numbers. That's where they come from. They don't, they, your analyzer doesn't go and say, well, NIST's got this, but today I think you're using a different type of material. No, it just says, you told me it's J-type, it matches NIST. Well, those well my the accuracy system that's in the like that, because the car allows for any type of thermocouple. Right, and you select the type of thermocouple you want. Usually there's a uh, software drop-down list or radar buttons or something. You say, on this data acquisition board, I've got a J-type thermocouple. If you select J-type thermocouple, built into the data acquisition system are those numbers to convert voltage to temperature. And then you're measuring in engineering units. Oh, see, that's, that's mine doesn't. OK, what does yours do then? It just gives you count. And you do the conversion on the ground. Oh, so you're or doing a separate conversion. So you're doing a separate conversion from, yeah. OK, so in that case, you aren't telling it it's a thermocouple. You're just telling it measure the voltage. Well, it is. I'm telling it it's a thermocouple because they have a thermocouple card because it has a whole junction. Reference. Oh, the reference junction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so anyway, you're doing, but but the question, my question was. But you're just telling it's a thermocouple, but not the type of thermocouple. That's right. Ah, that's it. And then you do the conversion after okay. the fact. Okay. And then the interesting thing, though, and what that was in my question is that if I remember correctly. Yeah, the table I use is the one I get from the manufacturer, which I assume is probably the same. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to guarantee these numbers exact, but uh, typically oh. NIST is, if you want it traceable to NIST, then they've got to be using the NIST numbers. And I'm sure NIST got them from the manufacturer originally. Right. Um, okay. They may have developed their own. Yeah, so in that case, that's different. But a lot of the data acquisition systems, when you where you select the thermocouple, you actually can say it is now a J-type thermocouple. And as soon as you do that, it switches in the polynomials which are built into the vector acquisition system. Now, one of the nice things for you is that you're still doing counts on the ATD board, so you can keep the data size small and then do the conversion later. If you have, if you select a type of thermocouple, it runs this through. You're now storing in engineering units, so the, the, the data size goes up. So you're storing real numbers as opposed to the integers. In your case, it's uh, I can see another tremendous advantage there. For yeah, leaps, yeah. And data size and because that's why they do it. This is the first time I've come across a system where you just say it's a thermocouple to reference the cold junction or the reference cell or whatever you call it. Yeah. We can fit other sites of uh, curves. I hinted at one of them, top right. If I do a ring down like this for a single degree of freedom system, or even a real structure which has a dominant mode, then we want the envelope on the outside here, and we can calculate from the decay of that the viscous damping ratio of our structure. And I would estimate that for this, if it's a real set of data, it looks to me like it's about between 2 and 5%. 
Oh, do you remember how I got that? Simon's now looking, how on earth can you tell from that graph that it's superimposed? So, remember what I said a couple of days ago? Most structures are 2 to 5%. So you don't need to measure it. Measure. But, um, but there, there's a curve fit we can do to try and pull that off. Another one here is a circle fit. I used to do a lot of circle fits. And I had to generate and develop the um, least squares regression algorithm from first principles. It was a pre-Google days, and so I couldn't just Google it. But I had to develop from first principles the curve fit routine for a circle, which has an arbitrary uh, origin or center and a set of data coming around. Um, and there we're looking for the error in this case is in a radial direction. Remember on the straight line, the error was always in the, the y direction. And here for the circle fit, the error is always in the radial direction. We need to minimize uh, that. Any idea where we do circle fits? If I plot a, and we'll see this in a bit later on, if I plot the transfer function for a single degree of freedom system, in fact, for a real structure, the new resonance, and I plot the in-phase component to the right and the in quadrature component down, the real and imaginary components, if you like, then we'll find that um, if I'm plotting velocity function, base function, um, this becomes a pure circle, theoretically, and it gets very close to the experiment. If I have a hysteretic or um, type of energy dissipation, and I plot displacement, it becomes a pure circle. And so I can use the curve fit on the circle to estimate the damping inside. It's one of the most powerful ways, modal analysis. And then we do all sorts of other curve fits. But basically, if you know the underlying science, and you know the underlying equation, we can generate a freedom squared type of curve fit. Uh, See, I want to see how far. Excuse me, here because I'm trying to fit in with um, <coughs> break. Okay, let's just uh, try and get to um, this before we break. We've gone over the 50 minutes, but I think that's that's not too bad. So, backing up here, one of the things we sometimes hear about is spline fitting. Have any of you done a spline fit on the data? Okay. So I was going to say, Ellie, have you ever done spline fits? And cubic spline is the most common, probably. Can you repeat this? Have you ever done a spline fit on data? Yeah, we use, we we already use it. Okay, so what is it? <sighs> it's that function in MathCAD, in MATLAB. <laughs> Essentially, a cubic spline says, let's take series of points, go through, and we're going to sit, fit cubics regularly in here. But what we're going to do is, as we transition from one cubic to the next, we're going to ensure that they have no, dis, um, uh, I use the word displacement, no um, jump at those points, so they're continuous. And they're also smooth, meaning that the slopes match. And so we sit, fit successive cubics to the data the cubics go exactly through the data points. And we also ensure that as we transition from one cubic to the next, that the it's uh, continuous, which means there's no step, and it is smooth, which means that the slope, or as it says here, the derivative is constant as well. And it's just a fancy way of doing a nice rolling. If you don't know what the curve fit is, how can we do it? And typically we'll use that for um, interpolation. Got some crazy data going on. Can be very powerful. It works. Can be very poor if it doesn't. So here's an example of data points. The discrete dots are the data points. There's the best fit straight line. The green one, the best fit cubic. The green one, oh, uh, it's cubic. Sorry. The uh, blue one, a seventh order polynomial. Is that a septic quick or something? I don't know. Quadratic, cubic, quartic, quintic, hexatic. It's probably a septatic or something. I'm not sure what that is. And the red one is a cubic spline. Which one fits best? I 
I've given you the black dots. Which curve fits best? The, the cubic spline? Okay, Ellie says the cubic spline. Simon? Oh, we should say... Uh, we no, don't no, know. You've had your go, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it depends. We don't, we don't oh, know. We don't know the underlying science. I think again. <laughs> All right. We had twice this morning in the last hour on that one. I, I, I retract my answer. I retract my answer. I can do that now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So, anyway, going back to this problem here, um, I think... I think this is wrong here, this 0.02%. I think isn't the definition of yields just 2%? I think rather than 2%. But basically, what we can do is once we've got our curve fit, we can now go back to the data, either with a higher order fit for the curve or, um, or just looking at the actual data itself and find where we get this offset. And I forget, I thought it was like 2%, but it's got here 0.02. It seems very, very tight. Whereas the official yield point um, for for that. Now, clearly, yield stress, yield point, that is in practice when we're starting to get plastic deformation, but we don't want to have to test everything, so we do have that fixed point. We get a certain point around the, um, uh, the, the, the nonlinear bit, uh, and that's a, a defined uh, point. So, there is the uh, set we can get there. So, static testing, the analysis is relatively unsophisticated. It can get complicated with some of the things, but usually it's not two problems. But we're going to get on to more problems when we get on to dynamic stuff. Okay, let's take our next break.